So welcome to the uh, Cashflow web webinar, Cashflow Management webinar is presented by Rappages. And um, just to kick off a little bit of housekeeping, um, I'm going to run through all my slides and there will be 10, 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for you, for you to ask your questions. But by all means, um, do post your questions in the, the Q&A um, box as we do go along the, the webinar and then I can try and address these as I go along or if not at the end of the, of the webinar. So good morning all. Just um, to kick off a, a little bit about myself. So my name is Mel Packer. I'm an associate partner here at Raffingers. I'm involved in all aspects of um, providing services to our clients from accounts, corporation tax to uh, general advisory like managing cash flow. Now, in terms of the type of clients that um, I look after in the firm generally, um, they're quite wide ranging. We have a lot of owner managed businesses, be it large or small, all the way up to very large corporates. Now, in terms of cash flow management, Generally, this tends to be a key issue impacting a lot of our clients, uh, regardless of the size. Now, in terms of a little bit about the firm Raffingers, we're an award-winning accountancy firm that specializes in strategic business planning and commercial solutions. And so what does that really mean in practice for, for a lot of our clients? Well, what it means is that we love to talk to our clients on a regular basis. We want to understand the key issues they face, and we're always striving to help find the best solution for our clients. And I suppose our key purpose and our mission statement is that we, we truly love to impact the lives of our people and our clients. And a lot of the time you'll see, and um, we speak about finding your personal freedom. So this can be time, financial or peace of mind. And we always try and focus on these freedoms and, and make sure that you see maximum results at all stages of your business cycle. Now, in terms of the services that we provide, um, we very much like to take the holistic approach in providing our our services, alongside providing the routine compliance services such as accounts, tax, VAT and payroll, we also um, provide a whole range of value added services. So services where we feel we get to know our clients a lot more better, try and understand their businesses in more detail, at the same time try and have a, a truly positive impact on their business. So this can be as listed things like strategy and um, cash flow management as we're going to be discussing today, uh, wealth management, corporate financing and tax planning. So, so like I said, really for us, it's um, in addition to these um, routine services where we get to know our clients in a more, um, more detailed look and, and try and understand their businesses and help them where possible. So let's get started. Now, before I kick off, um, when we were preparing for this webinar, we came across one of these quotes, which was, which was quite interesting. How many times have you sat with your accountant and, and looked at your accounts and they've said to you, oh, fantastic, you've had a great year. Your profit's been absolutely solid. But then you're sitting there in that meeting thinking, gosh, I haven't got any cash in the bank to show for it. So that's probably a moment of frustration for many business owners out there. So today's session is all about challenging you to become more aware of the cash flow cycles in your business. So you've got to really look at your business and say, okay, what can I do differently is to help improve that cash flow? Now, five key principles before we, we run into today's session that I really want to touch on and make sure that you understand is trying to keep cash flowing in your business. What are the key five things that you should understand as a business owner to ensure that your cash is always flowing continuously in your business? Well, firstly, without cash, your business will not survive. Cash flow is the lifeblood of any business. Without cash, you're not going to be able to pay your suppliers, you're not going to pay your overheads or your staff. And what we've seen from our experience is that you can have a very profitable business, but you can fail because of poor cash flow. Also, what you need to do is understand your key cash flow drivers. Now, what does this mean in practice? So you've got to look at the key generators of cash in your business, what makes cash come into your business, your sales, how you're chasing that in, but then also on the other side of things, actually what you're paying out. So for example, paying for stock, paying for overheads or buying new assets for your business. Thirdly, you've got to manage your business processes. That will really help you manage your business in terms of the most efficient way for cash flow. And it will also make sure that your cash flow cycle is, is continuously flowing. So for example, if you're looking at your accounts receivable process, how often are you chasing in your business, uh, your debtors and your sales that you've made in a year? Is that something you're doing on a regular basis? And if you're managing this business process efficiently, it will help you manage your cash flow at, at a better rate. Now, something that we've seen quite interestingly enough over time is that a lot of business owners tend to think that they understand their, their reasons for poor cash flow. But what they're probably doing is that they're looking at the symptoms of poor cash flow as opposed to the underlying causes. And sometimes actually treating the symptoms without actually fixing the underlying cause can be very time consuming for a business owner. 
So what you really need to do from your point of view is understand what is causing your poor cash flow and try and address the issue at source. And finally, probably the most important point on this slide is, and something I would say is the most important takeaway from today, is that you need to be prepared to make process changes. So if you're a business owner and you're sitting there and thinking, great, I understand everything we spoke about today in terms of cash flow and how to manage it more efficiently. However, I need to be committed to make that change. Now, a lot of business owners will understand the key things that drive their business, will understand the key fixes that they need to make to improve their cash flow. But a lot of business owners aren't necessarily committed or I suppose um, driven to make that change. So if that's the most important takeaway you, you have from today, I would say it's probably the best one. Now, in terms of the agenda for today, there's going to be six key areas that I want to speak about today before we go on to the final bit and your questions. Firstly, I want to look at the difference between profit and cash. So actually trying to understand what the key differences between these are. We'll then move on to the working capital cycle and then the cash conversion cycle for a lot of you, which, which you may not have necessarily come across. And then look at some sort of plan for yourself in terms of improving your cash flow. So what is it that you can do as a business owner to actually improve your cash flow and giving you some steps and, and some pointers to get you in the right direction? Then what we'll do is we'll move on to look at seven key causes of cash flow. So uh, uh, what actually causes your business to have quite a poor cash flow? And then from there, we can look at some sort of key, um, I suppose, key items that you can use to address that poor cash flow. And then finally, we'll look at next steps and any options that we can provide to support you in your journey. And then, like I said, we'll finish off with some questions at the end from yourselves. So profit versus cash. This is a, a common myth that we see with some clients where they will sit there and look at their annual accounts and go, fantastic, great. They look at their profit and think, I've got a load of cash that I can take out the business or use it to grow the business. But it's important that you understand the difference between them both. So what is the key difference? So what I've done here on the slide, I've just put very simple definitions in terms of what profit and cash are. So as you can see, profit is your total sales less any cost of stock or other expenses. Whereas cash is all your cash inflows less your cash outflow. Now, what we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, you can have a very profitable business, but it can go out of business because it's starved of cash. Whereas you can have a business which is effectively a loss making business, but somehow it survives because it has access to funds be it from investors or the owners or even other financing. And in terms of understanding the key differences, I've listed five key areas here where you may not necessarily understand and the difference. For example, if, you, if you've got a loan repayment, that won't impact your profit, but it will impact your cash that goes out of business. On the contrary, you've got something like depreciation, which doesn't impact the cash because it's an accounting entry whereas it does impact the profit for the business. So it's important to understand as a business owner that you're not necessarily going to have um, the same treatment for your profit and cash. So that's where it's important to understand what the difference is for these various items. So this really moves on, us on to the profit um, versus cash and the, the working capital cycle. The, the key difference between profit and cash is also really about timing. And, and what I've done here is I've prepared two um, simple examples to look at the working capital cycle. And as you can see from the offset, the, uh, the working capital cycle for these two different types of businesses is completely different. So for example, if you're a service provider, you can see that your working capital cycle is a lot more shorter, it's a lot more simpler. So in our example, the service provider will sell their services to that particular customer. Once that service provider has invoiced their customer, the amount will then sit in their accounts receivables ledger. So it will increase their trade debtors, the money that is owed to the company by the customers. But that money isn't necessarily in the bank at that point. It's still sitting in your accounts receivables trade debtor ledger. And effectively, from, from your point of view, you're going to be stuck in that cash flow cycle until you get paid. Effectively, that's your cash flow cycle. Now, on the other side of things, if you're a retailer or a manufacturer, your cash flow cycle and your working capital cycle is a lot more longer from this point of view. And you can see that where you, to make your goods, you're going to be purchasing some stock or materials. And at that time, when you purchase that stock or materials, you're going to have to pay your supplier. And some suppliers will say, great, we want our payment immediately. Some suppliers will say, actually, you know what? You can pay us within our payment terms, which could be the 20th of the month or 20th of the following month, for example. So that will even um, benefit your business to, to make sure that you pay your suppliers at a later date. 
And then that, at that point, the manufacturer will then manufacture the goods and basically will sit there with these, um, with these goods to then sell on to their customers. At that point of manufacturing those goods, you will be carrying work in progress. So this could be in the form of, say, stock or even unfinished goods. So that's where cash can be tied up in your, in your working capital cycle. And at that point, once that manufacturer makes that sales, so it translates it from work in progress down here all the way up to sales, you'll be sitting there with an invoice to a customer and an amount just like in our service providers business, sitting on your accounts receivable or your trade debtor ledger. And at that point, our retailer, our manufacturer has to wait for their customer to pay them. So as you can see from this simple example of two very simple businesses, that it can take some time in your working capital cycle to convert your inputs into cash. And depending on your type of business that you have, and if it's a service that you provide or if it's a product that you sell, the cash flow in your the cash flow based on your business can be quite um, can be quite detrimental if not managed properly. So then this moves us nicely on to the cash conversion cycle. So this is something that is not spoken about more commonly as the, as the working capital cycle. And again, to get you to understand exactly what the, the cash conversion cycle is all about, I've just looked at a very, very simple example of a wholesaler. Now, in this example, we've got day zero where our wholesaler buys stock from suppliers. So at that point when our wholesaler buys stock from suppliers, they might have some decent payment terms. That supplier will sit there and say, great, you know what, you can pay us on the 20th of the following month. And on average, what we tend to see is that you'll probably have around 35 days between buying the stock from your supplier and then actually paying the supplier for the stock that you brought. So this will take you to your cash out of your business. So at that point, you've had 35 days of your cash conversion cycle. Now, at the time when you buy that stock, you're not necessarily going to be able to sell that stock the moment it comes into the warehouse. So our wholesaler won't be able to sell it immediately. Some stock will sell quickly. Some stock will take longer to sell. And eventually, you're probably going to have some stock that's going to have to be discounted in order to be sold. So on average, what we tend to see is that this wholesaler probably holds their stock from day zero when they purchased it to when they sold it for, say, 65 days. That's a long time in terms of your average stock holding in, in your cash conversion cycle. But you get to that point when you sell that stock to the customer. So when you sell that stock, stock to the customer, you'll provide credit terms more often than not. And at the same time, you're going to have some customers who are going to pay you immediately. You're probably going to have some customers that are going to not observe your credit terms, and they'll probably pay you at a later date. So then on this example, we've worked out that the average time that our wholesaler will receive payment from selling the stock to getting the payment from the customer is around 45 days. So as you can see, we've got various different amounts of time here where cash is tied up in the cash conversion cycle. And then what that allows us to do is actually work out their cash conversion. And there's a simple formula down here at the bottom. So you've got 65 days where we've got the average stock holding. You add the 45 days to get paid from your customers. But then what you do take off is the 35 days where you've got credit from your suppliers. So that gives our wholesaler in this example a 75 day cash conversion cycle. So what does that mean for your business? Well, what I would say is you need to firstly try and look and understand your cash conversion cycle and try and look at some examples as I have done there previously of different types of products or services that you sell in your business and see if you can calculate your cash conversion cycle. And it's always important to remember, remember that the uh, shorter your cycle, the better the liquidity in your business. So it's always important to, to try and keep that point where you have basically um, a shorter cash cycle from actually receiving the money from your customers, because that's going to be the key driver in all of this. So moving on from this, what I've done is a, a worked example here to actually see what changes you can make to, to your cash, cash uh, conversion cycle and what impact that can have on your business. So in this simple example of, of a manufacturer, the uh, cash cycle was 76 days. Now, I, as we've done here previously, what we've looked at is if we were to reduce the debtor days by nine days, and if we were to increase the, sorry, reduce the inventory days by, by six days, the cash will increase in that business by 52,685 pounds, which if you look at it, the small changes of six and nine days in your inventory and debtor days respectively, that's a, a significant change in, in the actual cash. So what's a quite useful exercise for you guys to do as business owners is look at your cash conversion cycle. And then from there, 
try and see if you can improve that cash conversion cycle and actually try and see what financial impact it has on your business. And you'll be really surprised to see how much your cash will increase by. So now you've understood the working capital cycle, you now understand the cash conversion cycle. What is it that you can do as a business owner to improve your cash flow? So what we did before preparing for, for this webinar is that we, uh, we internally looked at four actions that we believe business owners can take to improve their cash flow. Now, the first one, and probably one of the most important ones on this slide is you need to understand your cash flow better. And the only way you can do that is by preparing a cash flow forecast. Now, by preparing a cash flow forecast, you really need to make this, um, I suppose, a committed, uh, a, a committed forecast where you do it annually as part of your business planning. And to be very, very honest with you, most of our successful clients always do this. They always prepare a cash flow forecast annually and um, they'll always make sure they, they're held accountable to it. Now, I can imagine if it's the first time that you've prepared this sort of cash flow forecast, it can be quite difficult to understand your key cash flow drivers. And also it can be quite challenging because you're talking about money and also talking about cash flow challenges that a lot of business owners don't necessarily like to own up to. But it's important to note that these types of challenges won't necessarily go away. So really, once you've done your cash flow forecast, you've got to think about the end goal. And once you've got that in place, it's going to give you a sense of peace and probably a sense of relief that you know, you've actually got something in place and you can actually use it to help benefit your business. Moving on from preparing your cash flow forecast, what I think is important to do as well is share your cash flow forecast with your bank or your accountant in, in our case. And what that will effectively do is help you build better communication lines and a stronger relationship with those stakeholders in your business. And at the same time, as a business owner, what you will probably end up seeing that you'll do is that you'll start to predict those months where there's not necessarily going to be more cash in your business than you think so. So for example, when you've got to pay your corporation tax bill or even when you have to pay your, your VAT. And at the same time, what we've seen for a lot of our clients when they've prepared cash flow forecasts is that they'll really help them prepare for their seasonal fluctuations. And um, for a lot of our clients, what I've seen when they've done the, uh, the cash flow forecast is that they're not necessarily flying, flying, any, um, flying blind anymore in terms of the issue of cash flow. So it's important that you get that cash flow forecast in place to, to help aid you in your business decisions. Now, the next point is all about incorporating your cash flow forecast into your accounting or reporting software. Now, many of you on the webinar today will probably be using some sort of accounting package like Xero, for example. So whatever accounting or reporting software that you do use, your forecast needs to be incorporated into or built into that software. So that really, from your point of view, what you can do is actually report the actual results on the forecast every month. And I think this is quite a, a strong thing to do for any business, because what it does is it enables you to recognize where you are against your goals and your targets. And a lot of the time where we have clients who do this, they start to learn and become more aware about where their cash flow cycles are and how they can improve them. So it almost holds them accountable to themselves. The next key um, cash flow improvement that we can suggest is setting a cash flow improvement plan. So really important to have your cash flow, like we mentioned in the first place, incorporating it into your software secondly, but at the same time, you need to have some sort of improvement plan. It's having the cash flow forecast in place is one thing, but having a plan and some sort of goals in terms of how you can improve your cash flow is another thing. So what you can do is use your cash flow on a regular basis to understand your cash conversion cycle, like we mentioned, and also then using that to set yourself some goals. So for example, you might want to reduce your debtor days down from 10 to five days, and you can really use that cash conversion cycle in your cash flow forecast uh, to do that for, from uh, a regular basis. And the final point on here, which I think, and I believe really is the most important point on the slide, is having someone independent to hold you accountable to your plan. Now, from my point of view, it's great to have someone to encourage support, and even sometimes as a business owner, nag you on you to, to work on your business. And really that's the, the fastest and the easiest way to get ahead in business. But in my opinion, that person should always be independent. It shouldn't be a family or a member of your family, your spouse or a friend, because they're not necessarily gonna hold you um, accountable regularly. And in our opinion, who better than your accountant to actually hold you accountable to your, to your cash flow improvement plans. So now we've talked about the working capital cycle, the cash conversion cycle, what are the four things that you can do to improve your cash flow? I wanted to talk about the, um, the key causes of, of poor cash flow for any business. 
And so like before, when we were preparing for this webinar, um, we, we brainstormed internally to try and understand from our clients and our experience, what has caused our clients to have poor cash flow? What are the key seven things that we've seen in our experience that cause our clients to really find it difficult to manage their cash? And the first one, and probably the most important one that I've seen uh, on a regular basis is a poor accounts receivable process. So this is where you have the time between you build your client for a particular service or a product, and then you actually receive the cash. And a lot of the time for our clients, this could be something which is, which is quite too high for their business. They don't necessarily have a, um, an account receivable process in place. And effectively, this stifles your cash flow massively. The second point is your accounts payable process. And a lot of our clients don't necessarily want to review, in our experience, their supplier agreements or their supplier terms. And this can be a really good way to really improve your cash flow because what you can do is review your supplier terms and try and get a better terms of trade and see if you can, I suppose, um, increase the time that you have to pay your suppliers. The third one, which people don't necessarily see a lot, is your inventory process. So, for example, you might be carrying stock for too long. And what that means in practice is where you probably end up having full shelves, the empty bank accounts effectively. And what you'll see is that your cash is pretty much tied up in your stock. Um, and a really good example here, really, for, for a lot of our clients is the, the work in progress. Because if you're a service provider, for example, you won't necessarily have any stock. So you're going to have your services that you provide. Just like us, we're an accountancy practice. We, we provide accountancy services. We have rather than stop work in progress. So effectively, our cash will be held up in our, our work in progress cycle. So for example, if I were to prepare a set of accounts for a client and I wasn't going to deliver those accounts, say for a, for a couple of months, I'm not going to necessarily be paid for, for those accounts for, for a few months at least. So that's where cash is held up in our inventory process as a service provider. The fourth point on here is uh, your debt and capital structure. So what you'll probably see with, with uh, a lot of different types of businesses, when they've taken out their debt or a particular loan, that debt or that particular loan was fit for purpose at the time. But since then, the business has evolved, the business has changed or grown, and the debt that they have at the time isn't necessarily fit for purpose where they are currently. So what you should do at that point is try and review your debt structure and see if you can consolidate or pay off your, your debt over a longer or shorter term. And then with regards to the capital structure, where we see indicators of poor cash flow is where we have business owners just taking too much too much money out of the company. So for example, you could have that in the form of owners' drawings or dividends. And that's where business owners need to look at themselves honestly and say, hmm, should I really be taking out this volume of cash or should I be reinvesting it in the business to help it grow? The fifth point, and probably the most common one that we see with our clients regularly is where the overheads are too high. So this is a really good example where um, if we sit with our clients on an annual basis and we go through their annual accounts, more often than not, you'll sit there with a client and go, gosh, I can't believe I've spent that amount on advertising. And sometimes to me, that's quite a shock because you would feel that the business owners themselves would know exactly um, how much they're spending and, and the volume in terms of um, what they're getting back for, for that spend. But a lot of the time, business owners don't necessarily look at their overheads. So what I can suggest from this is that every business owner should thoroughly review their overheads and do it on a regular basis. The fifth, um, sorry, the sixth point here is um, all about your gross profit margins. And this is a point that isn't necessarily addressed too much um, by business owners or even accountants, where you can have um, really low gross profit margins that can cause poor cash flow. And effectively, what this means um, in business for yourselves, where you have low gross profit margins, it's where your variable costs can be too high. And so what you need to do as a business owner at that point is understand what strategies you can implement to reduce those variable costs to improve those margins. And the final point on this slide is all about your sales. Now, I know it's quite a simple point, but it's a point that not necessarily everyone thinks about, that poor cash flow is caused by low sales. We've seen it time and time again where uh, a business isn't necessarily generating enough sales to cover their home overheads of their business, be it their payroll costs or their rent. So it's important to understand that if your sales levels are too low, it's going to cause a massive impact to your cash flow. So now we've looked at the seven key causes of, of poor cash flow. What I want to go into is looking at each individual cause and what you can do as a business owner to try and improve that. So firstly, the account receivables process. So what are the ways in which you can shorten your cash conversion cycle by getting paid faster by your customers? Well, firstly, what I would say is 
you need to review your terms of trade. Now, a lot of the time, um, clients will um, possibly draft their terms of trade at the uh, initial commencement of their business when they've incorporated and they've left them for many years. So what you need to do is just have a review of those again and say, okay, actually, are these terms of trade clear to our customers? Do they actually understand when they need to pay us by? And are there any late payment penalties as well? And then from that, what you could do is look to incorporate a, a discount for prompt payment for your clients. So if they pay you earlier, they actually have to pay you less. And this can sometimes be a really effective method of getting money into the business a lot more quicker than you usually have. Something which is important for any business, which I think you, you should always think about is bidding faster. So if you're a service provider or you sell products or stock, you should always try and bill on completion. But at the same time, look at ways in which you can try and do some sort of interim bidding. So get paid as part of providing that service along the way. And that's quite important for, for businesses like ours as, as accountants, where we try to um, interim bid our clients on large projects or large work. So we're managing our cash flow cycle effectively. The, the next point I would say in terms of um, improving your accounts receivables process would be to look at easier payment alternatives. Now, make it easy as possible for your clients to pay you. So for example, look at um, online invoicing, sending everything electronically, but at the same time, making it easy for your clients to, to actually pay you, be it with credit card or debit, debit card terminals, or even having some sort of link on the email that you sent to your clients to say, if you want to pay, you can click on this link and it will take you directly to, to pay online. So what you're trying to do is make that process as smooth and easy as possible for your clients to pay you. And, and the next point, which is quite an interesting one that we've picked up with a, with a few clients in, in, previous, in previous experiences is um, fixed debtor control processes, where you don't necessarily have a debtor control process and it's not a, a properly documented process. And this is quite common for owner managed businesses because you're always on the go, you're trying to provide the best service to your clients. But what tends to happen is you'll invoice the client and you'll bill them, but you won't necessarily have a process to then chase that bill in. What you should do is document your existing process, understand exactly where the key flaws are in that process, and try and improve that to ensure you've got some sort of fixed data control process. So as soon as you bill your client, you're then chasing them within, say, for example, 14 days. You're then chasing them again after, say, 28 days. So you've got that fixed process to make sure you're continuously chasing your debts in. And the final point I would say, um, especially for those who are using an online software like Xero, is, is look at any add-ons or apps, for example, something like Debtor Daddy or Chaser, that can really help you, I suppose, automate your, your accounts receivables process and actually chase those, those invoices in. The next one, which is the accounts payable process, is, is quite an interesting one because people don't necessarily look at the accounts payable process as, a, as a, an improvement for their cash flow. They always try to focus on the accounts receivables process in terms of getting money into the business. But it's equally important to look at how your money is going out of the business, your key cash flow driver. So what I would do firstly is look at your terms of trade with your suppliers, ensure that you're paying on time and making sure that you're not incurring any late payment penalties. And interestingly enough, when you're going through your um, terms of trade with your suppliers, try and see if there's any prompt payment discounts and even suggest that to your suppliers to say, look, if I was to pay you within two or three days of purchasing the stock, is there any way in which we can get some prompt payment discounts? And that can really aid your cash flow because effectively you're going to be paying less in the long term anyway. Really from, from that, you need to review your supply agreements, I would say. So like I said, payment terms, prompt payment discounts, but also quite an interesting one is delivery charges. See if you're paying delivery charges and see if you can negotiate that with your um, with your suppliers and, and get some sort of reduced delivery charges and, uh, and see how that can improve your cash flow. The next one really for me, which is quite important is reviewing your payment processes. Now, a lot of clients will focus on their accounts receivables process and how they're actually collecting the money in, but not many clients will review how they're actually paying their suppliers as an example. So they won't go through and say, okay, how often do we pay our suppliers? Are we paying them on a weekly basis? Is it very sporadic or ad hoc? And try and set up a process where you're regularly paying your suppliers be on every Friday, for example, you'll go through all the bills received for that week and, and you try and make a prompt payment to your suppliers to get the discounts. And the final point I would say on, on the accounts payable process is actually having spending budgets in place. Now, this is quite unique for, for I think, a lot of our owner managed businesses because they don't tend to forecast or budget. If you have a spending budget in place, let's just say, for example, something like advertising or marketing, 
if you then start to compare your actuals against your budgets, you'll then start to investigate those appearances. So you can say, okay, we've actually spent more than we budgeted at the beginning of the year on advertising or marketing. And then that will really help you investigate those differences and really understand where your cash flow is going. Why are you getting the poor cash flow from advertising and marketing? What have you done effectively to, to ensure that you've paid more than you actually budgeted? And it really is about investigating in your business in terms of, of, of where you're spending your cash. The next key point in terms of causes of poor cash flow is your inventory process. Now, again, like I said, this, this might not necessarily be strictly applicable for, for service providers, but for companies who hold stock and sell products. But at the same time, it's important to try and apply these principles to service providers into your, into your work in progress. Now, what tends to happen is you need to try and shorten your cash cycle by moving stock faster. And where I've seen it more commonly with our clients who hold stock is they have a poor um, stock ordering system, basically. And interestingly enough, we had one client whereby their stock ordering system was controlled by one of the employees. And at the time, it was, it was completely out of control because the employee in question would effectively order stock as in when they required it. And they never really looked at it from a cash flow point of view. And they never looked at it to say, OK, do we have the sufficient cash in the business to order stock? Are we going to turn this stock around to get it sold within a sufficient amount of time to ensure we get paid for this? So it's important as a business owner to review your stock ordering system. And what I would say is try and use technology. Try and use technology to better manage your stock reordering system and look at slow moving stock as well. Because technology can help you identify where there is slow moving stock and whether you need to, to actually try and see what you can do to discount the stock to, to get it sold and, and receive the cash for it. And from that, what I would do is if you do experience slow moving stock as a, as a business owner, have some sort of slow moving stock policy in place. So for example, if you've held stock, say, for more than six months, have a policy in place to say that you'll reduce the, the sales value by 50% in order to get it sold and get cash into the business. And then finally, what I would say is once you have that stock control process, once you have that stock ordering system, document that. Document that and then communicate it to your team because effectively your staff are going to be the ones who are going to be controlling this on a day-to-day -day basis. And if they can understand your stock control process, your stock ordering process, they're going to be more brought into the idea of, of managing it better and then effectively managing your cash flow. So moving on in terms of the debt and capital structure, a lot of our clients who have got loans or debts or all sorts of financing can sometimes feel that that debt is weighing their business down. And like I mentioned in the previous slide, what tends to happen is that when you've taken out that loan or when you've taken out that sort of financing at the time, you've probably been sitting there thinking, this is great for us at the initial um, time of taking out that loan. But as the business has evolved, as the business has changed, what you need to understand and, and review really is that debt or is that particular financing that you've done fit for purpose for your business of where you are now. And so at that point, you might want to refinance, you might want to consolidate your debt. And you can do that really by a different number of ways. You need to look at your interest rates. You need to see whether you've got fixed or variable interest rates. Are those interest rates competitive in comparison to current market rates? And what you can do is actually review your terms of your loan and say, look, is the actual, um, uh, uh, I suppose, time we have to pay suitable for where we are in business at the moment? Can we pay this loan off quicker? Or do we need to possibly reconsolidate our loan and look to pay it off over a longer period to help our cash flow. And what's interesting with regards to the capital structure, and it's probably an on, honest conversation that business owners need to sort of have with themselves, and something that I mentioned on my earlier slide, is review your drawings, review the dividends that you're taking out of the business, actually look at the cash that you're withdrawing out of the business as a business owner. And honestly, you shouldn't really avoid this discussion because it's something that will have a massive impact on your cash flow. And more interestingly enough, if you weren't to draw that money out of your business and you were to, I suppose, leave it in the business, and what you'll tend to see is that you can use that cash flow and use that cash to grow your business and hopefully generating in a greater cash flow in the longer term. And finally, what you can do in terms of improving your debt and capital structure, I suppose, is look at new investment. So firstly, like I mentioned earlier about reconsolidating your existing debt, but also look at investment from possibly new owners or from other sources try and see if you can get some sort of equity funding to improve the cash flow and then further grow the business in the longer term. So the next slide is all about your overheads. And, and a lot of our business owners that we meet, sometimes they, they will say to us, that they, they will go, 
oh, you know, the overheads are weighing the business down. The overheads are just too high. We can't generate enough sales to meet those overheads. And what I find interesting with a lot of this is that they'll talk about their overheads being too high. But if we sit there and go through the annual accounts, they won't know or they won't have an idea of roughly how much they've spent on certain overheads. And like I mentioned in the earlier example, where you sit there with a client and they'll go, gosh, I can't believe how much I've spent on advertising and marketing, or I can't believe I've spent that much on my rent. So sometimes that really takes me back because I think, aren't you reviewing your overheads on a regular basis? And that's the key thing here, really. As a business owner, you need to review your overheads on a regular basis, but you also need to review it thoroughly. You need to understand exactly what you're paying for. And a lot of the time, what you can do is see if you can get better deals. For example, if you can get a better deal with your IT supplier, you can look at your phone costs. And sometimes what I've seen with a lot of our clients is they look at their insurance costs or their um, uh, fleet costs, and they will then go to a broker, for example, to see if they can get better better deals and they can get um, better costs for what they're paying for. And this is quite proactive, I think, because this is, at the end of the day, only going to benefit the business by reducing the overheads. And an interesting example that we had recently with one of our clients was that they actually went paperless. And they actually went paperless to try and um, you know, help reduce their overheads. So they looked at their actual costs and they could see that they were spending a huge amount on the printing costs, on ink, on toner, on paper, because everyone in the office was, was actually spending, printing everything and, and effectively they were spending too much. And as a result of going paperless, the impact it had on their cash flow was drastic because they no longer had these huge printing costs. So you need to understand what the key drivers are of your overheads and what you can do to reduce them. And I suppose the final point I would make on this, and it's a point that I've made earlier in, in the webinar, is having budgets in place. So as you would have budgets in place for, for your cash flow forecast and understanding what's happened and comparing it to your budgets, have, have a budget in place for your overheads. So at the beginning of the year or every six months, set yourself budget to say, okay, we're only going to spend X amount on this particular overhead. And when you do go over that amount at any point in time, you can then review that. And that will help you understand your, your reasons why you're having poor cash flow because you're reviewing your variances and you're understanding the reasons behind that. Now, moving on in terms of the, the next point, gross profit margins. And like I mentioned when, when we're talking about these earlier on the summary slide, is that not a lot of business look at, not a lot of businesses look at their um, gross profit margins margins and say whether that can improve their cash flow. They won't necessarily look at um, their margins and go, okay, yeah, that's a key area where we can try and get more cash into the business. Now, as I, as I mentioned on my previous slide, um, your gross margin is all about your variable costs and your sales, but more importantly, what you can do with your variable costs. So what you need to try and understand is if you're looking at things like materials or labor costs or stock that you're purchasing, is there anything you can do as a business owner to reduce those variable costs? So you can look at your systems and you can look at your processes and try and make those more efficient. And what's interesting with this is looking at the supplier payments that you make. Like I mentioned before, talk to your suppliers on a regular basis and say, look, by the way, if I was to pay you in half the time that I normally pay, is there any opportunity to get some discount? And that will really have a positive impact on your cash flow because effectively what you're doing in the longer term is you're actually paying less to your suppliers. And that really nicely takes us on to our, our next slide in terms of gross profit margin and all about your sales. So the final point I made on the summary slide was that not a lot of business owners will think about sales and say, yes, we need to increase sales to generate more cash flow. They'll always look at their accounts receivables process and always look at how they're chasing money into the business. But at the same time, it's equally important to look at your sales. Try and see which different ways in which you can increase your, your sales for the business. So firstly, what I would say is look at your existing customer base, look at your existing client base. For us as a business, we tend to get the most referrals from our existing clients because we, we try to provide the best possible service to our existing clients and they love to do work with us. So look at your customer retention rates. Try and see if you can do more work for them and they're staying with you. At the same time, it's also important to, to generate new business. So you should try and generate more leads. Try and see if you can do some more business development and some more marketing to try and increase your sales. And as, as part of that process, you need to look at your conversion rates as well. So with your conversion rates, for example, you could be quoting for, for 10 bits of business at any one time. If that only leads to say three or four converted sales, you need to look at that process and understand that why is it that I'm not necessarily converting at a higher rate? Why are not say eight or nine clients coming on board with me. 
So actually look at your conversion rate process and see if you can improve that. And I suppose the final point in terms of increasing sales, look at your transaction value. An, an easy win, and I suppose the key win is, is looking at increasing your prices in line with inflation. A lot of businesses do do that. They wouldn't write to their customers or their clients on an annual basis to say that they're increasing their prices. More often than not, your gas or your, your energy supplier will write to you every year to say, by the way, we're going to increase our pricing by 5%. So it's important to know that you can increase your sales by, by looking at your transaction values and seeing if you can increase those. So now we've really talked about all the different causes of poor cash flow. I've given you some really nice ideas, hopefully, in, in trying to mitigate those um, key causes of your poor cash flow. So what's the solution? What can we do to help you? How can we help you take it forward? I suppose we can really summarize it into, into two main areas to begin with. The first thing we can do is provide a cash flow forecast service and we can help you to draft your cash flow forecast and at the same time once we've prepared that we'll sit with you to actually review your cash flow forecast and make sure it's in line with your expectations and also at the same time you understand it and you can focus on on growing your business in line with your cash flow forecast and then what really comes out of that very nicely for us is the cash flow management coaching now what we can do is design a, I suppose, a very personalized program and be, say, for example, a 12 month program to help you maximize your cash flow potential. And what's important in that basis is that for us, where we prepare the cash flow forecast in the initial onset when we take when we take this on board with yourselves, it gives us a chance to hold you accountable when we do the regular coaching, because it gives us a chance to sit with you and say, okay, in the last six months, your forecast of cash flow was going to be X, you've only achieved Y. And it really asks you those difficult questions and, and holds you accountable from someone independent like ourselves. However, if you're not necessarily feeling too keen on the cash flow forecast or the cash flow management coaching to begin with, what I would say is definitely attend our, our next seminar, which is our free seven ways to, to grow your business seminar. And this is on the 22nd of November. And what this will do is going back to the previous slides, this will really help you increase your sales, which in effect, hopefully now you understand, will increase your cash flow. So to finish off on things, um, once this webinar is finished, the next steps effectively are going to be an evaluation form. And um, we'll really appreciate if you can um, complete this honestly, and uh, we definitely really value your feedback to help us improve these going forward. But more so for yourselves, identify the three most important actions that you want to take as a business owner. What are the three key things that you listen to today and say, yes, I definitely want to take those away and implement them. And really, in my experience, what tends to happen is that business owners really tend to sit in four, four buckets from our point of view. What they tend to do is they, they tend to either do nothing and say, oh, wow, that was a really interesting seminar. I really like the way he spoke about certain things. But you know what? I think I'm just going to go back to my business and continue what I'm doing. Or secondly, they might retreat and go, oh, gosh, that was a bit scary. It all looked a bit difficult. I think I'm going to go back to my business and hide away and hopefully everything should be okay. And then you have those who say, oh, do you know what? That was really interesting. I'm going to take a normal amount of action. I think I need a cash flow forecast, but do you know what? I think I can do it myself. And most likely what will end up happening is that that individual or that business owner will probably end up doing something, but it will end up leading to nothing. And over time, they'll retreat and not necessarily use their cash flow forecast. Or finally, you can be that proactive business owner, that business owner that really wants to grow their business and have a successful business that really hits one of their free freedoms in terms of time, money, or peace of mind. So you sit there and go, great, I've really brought into that. I want to take massive amounts of action. And I know these guys, they understand my business and I want them to help me improve my business. So think about your key takeaways for today and what kind of business owner you want to be and how you want to improve your business going forward. So before we get into the questions, I'm just going to leave you with this parting thought and something that we came across when we were preparing for this today. Hopefully after attending today's seminar, these are the words that you'll hopefully never have to hear again. So just to finish off, um, I'll take a look at some questions that we've got at the moment from, from the guys and then we can address any other questions that you might necessarily have as well.
Okay, so we just had one, a couple of questions just come in in quick succession. So um, first question that's just uh, just come in is um, talking about um, financing and how we can help with that and, and, and both get financing and reconsolidating. So interestingly enough, um, what I would say is if you are looking at reconsolidating your, your existing debt financing, and if it's something, as I mentioned before, that you've taken out many years ago and isn't necessarily fit the purpose for your business, what you need to do is um, effectively speak to us and then we can review, review your existing debt financing and then help provide you with solutions in terms of contracts that we have to, to better provide that, that debt financing solution that works for your business now. So um, what I would say is the best thing you need to do is actually speak to us about the debt financing that you do have in place. And then what we can do is help um, you find the best debt financing that will, um, will consolidate what you have existing at the moment and then really make your fit for purpose going forward. The next question we've got is um, on how to go about arranging a meeting. So what I would say is um, at the end of the seminar, I'll, I'll keep my details as I have here. Best thing to do is either email myself or call me up or, or get in contact um, with us through, through the various different um, forms of contact us, be it through the website or just the general email address. And um, let us know that you want to have a, have a, have a meeting in terms, of, um, in terms of discussing your cash flow forecast or your cash flow coaching and then what we can do is um, look to implement a strategy with yourselves in terms of trying to get a cash flow forecast in place but then at the same time um, getting some sort of program in place to hold you accountable. Um, also just for, uh, for the benefit of yourselves we have another question that's just coming with regards to the recording. A, a recording will be sent round of, of the seminar and also the slides so you can use the, uh, the slides especially with things like the cash conversion cycle and then also the um, working capital cycle, because I know those are slightly tricky things for you to possibly understand from the offset whilst just um, listening to this presentation. So what I would say is look back on those, those slides and try and work out your cash conversion cycle and your, your working capital cycle to help you understand what it is for your business and how you can improve it. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any further questions. Um, so unless I hear otherwise in the next 10, 15 seconds, we'll, um, we'll leave it there. But, but like I said, do get in contact with us. Um, my details are here on the screen. And also, if you want to contact us just generally through, through the website or through the various forms of social media, we'll be more than happy to, um, to speak to yourselves with regards to your cash flow management and forecasting and, and going forward and anything else that you really feel that, that worries you about your business. Thank you for, uh, for listening in today. And um, we appreciate that. Thank you very much.